Hello everyone and welcome to the last recorded lecture of Anatomy and Physiology 1 online. Today's lecture will be finishing up chapter 16, which is on sense organs, and specifically we will be discussing vision. So take a good look at this picture and try not to move your eyes. So try to fixate on your computer screen and just look at the flag and count to 30. I'll wait. So keep fixating. Your eyes should not be moving. and they should still be fixated. And what did you just see? You should have seen a brief flash of an image of the flag, but in the red, white, and blue colors. And you can try that illusion again. And this was brought up in the crash course. Um, the link is right here. And we will be able to explain the answer a little more clearly after we talk about vision. So I'd like you to stop here and watch this video that's embedded um, in the PowerPoint that discusses how the eye works on a very um, basic level. So like an overview of how vision works because vision is very hard to understand. Um, and this is a three minute summary slide, summary video that's really well made. Um, so that's something to do right now before we get any further. So what is vision? Right. Vision is the perception of objects in the environment by means of light they emit or reflect. And let's just take a sample, uh, a, a time to define what light is. Um, light is visible electromagnetic radiation from the sun. So the sun has a spectrum. There's an electromagnetic spectrum. So there's all of these forms of energy that reach planet Earth from the sun. But most of the solar radiation of shorter and longer wavelengths is filtered out by ozone and uh, other gases in the environment. So the radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth falls within a very narrow range, and even a more narrow um, part of that is visible to us. So human vision is limited to wavelengths of light from 400 to 700 nanometers. So this is the whole spectrum. We have on one on one end, we have the very high frequency gamma rays. And then the other end, we have very low frequency, long wavelength radio waves. And radio waves and microwaves and infrared waves, rays are all invisible to us. Microwaves can heat up water molecules and food, for example. Radio waves can help transmit sound energy. Infrared can be used for imaging techniques and you can heat something with IR, um, and we could use UV light and x-rays, for example, but these are damaging. These would be outside of the visible spectrum of light, and x-rays would are not visible to, to our eyes, and in fact, damage DNA. Um, what light does within the, uh, the narrow spectrum of 400 to 700 nanometers, what the light does, it causes a photochemical reaction in the retina cells and in the retina of the eye to produce a nerve signal that's sent to the brain. So light is the stimulus in this case. And the sense receptors are in the retina of the eyeball. And of course the optic nerve, um, which is a cranial nerve, links the retina to the brain. Um, and just to give you more specific examples, UV light, like I mentioned, has way too much energy and that's why it destroys macromolecules. So the reason why it destroys DNA, for example, it can break a DNA double helix is because it has way too high frequency, way too much energy. IR on the other hand has too little energy to cause reactions. So it wouldn't really be functional um, to cause a photochemical reaction um, to produce a nerve signal. So we have this very narrow range of visible light um, that comes from the sun and we know the spectrum is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Those are the colors of the rainbow, so to speak. 
So eyes are the organs of vision. I think that was something you've known for quite a while. Um, they're located within the orbits of the skull. And there are seven skull bones that protect each eye. Um, so the skull bones themselves like, are, I think, pretty obvious. The frontal bone, I mean, some are not obvious, actually. The frontal bone in front, and we have the maxillary bone and the zygomatic bone, right, make the out the anterior out, outer boundary of the orbit. And in the back, we have the sphenoid and the ethmoid and the lacrimal bones, as well as a little bit of the palatine bone, which you don't see here. Um, and in addition to the bone protecting the eye, we have connective tissue that provides support and protective cushioning for the eyeball. And the eye contains more than 70% of the body's sensory neurons. So of all of our sensory perceptive neurons, they're mostly located in the eyes. And the eye, eye vision is supposed to be our principal sense, our, our most refined sense as humans, is our our stereoscopic vision and our color vision, meaning our ability to, to distinguish between depth, like our depth perception, and our ability to distinguish between colors. Other organisms can detect even more colors than us, so I don't, so don't want to put humans on a pedestal, um, but I will say that of all the senses, the one that we do best is probably vision. Outside of the eye, we have some accessory um, anatomy to talk about. So the eyelids protect the anterior surface of the eye and they help us blink. And what blinking does is it helps spread tears and mucus. Um, so as we blink, the secretions from the lacrimal gland, which is which are tears, are able to be spread as we blink. And the conjunctiva is this very thin membrane it's um, very it's transparent and it lines the internal eyelid surface and the anterior surface of the eye. So the eyelid surface and the anterior surface of the eye. And this is what produces mucus. So this has goblet cells to produce mucus to lubricate the eye. And it also has many blood vessels and nociceptors. So the conjunctiva is very susceptible to pain. So this is why sticking a needle in your eye might be painful, not the best idea. Outside of the eye, we have eyelashes that help protect, keep anything floating in the air from getting into the eye. It also um, has minimal protection from excessive light. Um, the eye also can help trigger the blink reflex. With um, So the eyelashes can help uh, at like a particle hits the eyelash, then it's going to, you're going to blink right away. Um, the eyebrows shield the eye from any light that's directly overhead. So the eyelashes and the eyebrows both have that same kind of function and they have a slight shielding effect. They help minimize excess light from getting into the eye. Uh, but eyebrows have the additional effect of diverting sweat. So if you perspire from your, your forehead, um, if you didn't have an eyebrow, it would go right into your eye. So your eyebrow and your eyelash kind of do the, they have very similar functions um, when you think about it. They both keep things out of the eye, help keep light out of the eye, and help, um, while the eyelashes help trigger the uh, blink reflex. Um, but I think they pretty much do the same thing and are not as needed in humans as um, other organs, right? So we don't really need eyebrows or eyelashes. You would be able to be just fine survival. So like we would say, it doesn't really add to fitness at all. Um, so that can be something that was kind of just passed along through evolution. Um, okay, so here's just some other images. This shows the lacrimal gland that produces tears. And as we blink, the tears move medially, and they get collected in the nasolacrimal duct. So again, so tears are secreted by the lacrimal gland. This is the lacrimal gland. And ducts, those are excretory ducts, carry tears to the eye surface. 
And the purpose of tears is to lubricate and wash the eye of any debris, but to also deliver oxygen, nutrients, and enzymes. So tears are important for nutrition and protection. And there's an important enzyme called lysozyme that I'd like you to know about. So lysozyme is an enzyme that's also found in um, mucus and egg whites and lots of other things. But in our tears, we have a lot of lysozyme and it's like a scissor that breaks up bacterial cell walls. So if we get bacteria in our eye, we have lysozyme that chops up the bacteria so they can't infect us or can't get inside of our eye or our, our brain. Um, and again, so tears are spread medially and inferiorly every time we blink. So that's the purpose of the eyelid. And the nasal lacrimal duct will carry the tears into the nasal cavity. And when we cry, we oftentimes have like a runny nose. You need a tissue. And this explain, this is explained by the nasal lacrimal duct. Right? When you cry, you have excess tear secretions flowing into your nasal cavity. So you're going to have to use a tissue to blow your nose. So there are muscles that control the eye. There are six extrinsic muscles of the eyeball. They all originate on the back of the orbit and they insert on the eyeball itself. They're called the rectus. We have four rectus muscles. We have a superior rectus muscle. We have a lateral rectus muscle. We have an inferior rectus muscle and a medial rectus muscle. So we have superior, inferior, medial, lateral rectus muscles. And those do exactly what the name suggests. So superior moves the eye up, inferior down, right? medial will move it to the left, lateral to the right, depending on um, the eye. And you're gonna have the other two muscles are called the obliques. Superior oblique and the inferior oblique, but they all work together to function coordinated. You know, it's if they all enable very fine movements of the eye together. And um, the oculomotor nerve is one of the nerves that control this. So the brain works through the cranial nerves to control the eyeballs functioning and the coordinated movements for vision. So here's a view of the rectus muscles. Here's the inferior oblique, superior oblique, superior rectus, inferior rectus, the lateral rectus and the medial rectuses on the other side. So let's talk about the eye itself. And the eye is composed of three layers. The wall of the eye is composed of three layers and it's hollow inside. And it's about an inch in diameter. So think about the eye as a hollow sphere with a wall made of three layers. There's the fibrous layer, the vascular layer, and the neural layer. Inside, we have the spaces are filled with fluids that help support the eye's structure and shape. So this is a good picture that we can keep on referring to in discussing the anatomy of the eye. So already in this picture, you can see a nice cross section that shows the three layers. You have the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. So these are the three layers of the wall. And then this whole chamber over here is filled with, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but these two chambers over here are filled with fluids. So let's talk about the fibrous layer first, which is the outermost portion of the eye. And the fibrous layer itself has two parts. So this is the outermost layer of the eye, the most superficial part, uh, part of the eye. And this has two parts, the fibrous layer. The sclera, the sclera is the white portion of the eye. So the eye, the whites of the eye are called a sclera and it's very, very, very tough. And I wish we had an opportunity to do a dissection um, because you would see how tough the sclera is when trying to puncture it. It is very hard, it's very firm, um, very fibrous. In addition, the other port portion of the fibrous layer is called the sclera and the sclera is a clear, I'm oh, sorry, is, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. The other portion is called the cornea. 
But before I talk about the cornea, I'm going to talk about the um, what the pur purpose of the sclera is. The sclera is the major protective organ of the eye. If you get something like a stone in your eye, you're not going to rupture your eye. You're not going to be able to affect the optic nerve, at least, because you have so much protection from the sclera. It's so fibrous and multi-layered. And we said that the anterior portion is covered with conjunctiva, which produces mucus. So the whole purpose of the sclera is to protect the eye and the optic nerve, what's behind it, right? We don't want to we don't want to harm this neural layer, uh, the retina, because it's directly connected to the optic nerve, which is linked to the brain. So we need this very tough fibrous protection. And the cornea is the other part of the fibrous layer that is a clear, it's a clear window. And the purpose of a cornea is to bend light rays as they pass through it. So they hit the right part of the retina at the right time. So again, to summarize, the eye wall has three layers. The outermost layer is called the fibrous layer, right? These layers are also called tunics. So a tunic is a layer. The outermost tunic is the fibrous layer that has the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is white. We have a lot of protection. It is so dense. It's, connect it's dense connected tissue. So it is great protection against any damage to the nervous system behind it. And then the cornea, we said, is like a window. It's a clear window that helps bend light rays um to hit the retina in the right way um, the cornea is clear and it lacks blood vessels and nerves so you can't feel anything if your cornea um, is scratched i think actually it should be in theory i've never got my cornea but if there's no nerves it should not hurt however the conjunctiva it would be pretty hard to avoid the conjunctiva because that is very rich with uh, nociceptors. So this is a good diagram that shows cornea and then sclera together making the fibrous tunic or the fibrous layer. Now we can talk about the middle layer called the vascular layer or the tunica vasculosa. And this includes three parts. It includes the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. So the choroid is located everywhere except just the anterior portion of the eye. So remember, we're talking about a layer that goes all the way around. So there's choroid is, is shown over here. This choroid is this pink stuff. Um, well, actually, it's really not a good picture of that. Uh, the choroid is all the blood vessels that nourish the eye. So you can't, I want to see if I have a better, again, really important to see um, in a dissection. But you can imagine the pink part is where the choroid would be. And it's really rich with blood vessels. So that's what nourishes the eye the most. So think about vascular layer, blood vessels. Blood vessels um, nourish the eye with oxygen, but it's also filled with melanin. So if you were to do the dissection, you would see that the choroid is kind of black in the sheep eye. And the black um, pigment helps any backscattering of light so it can focus on the retina. And like I think of the example of like a movie theater, like you want to make it dark in a movie theater so you can focus on the screen. So that's what the melanin in the choroid kind of does. So you can focus the light on the retina, which is the screen. And what's shown here is the ciliary body, which is a muscle. So the ciliary body has cil ciliary muscles that surround the lens. And the ciliary body, so it's an extension of the choroid in the anterior portion. So the choroid is all over here, all around here. And then here we have the ciliary body. And the ciliary body helps support the iris, which we'll talk about, and it helps keep the lens in place. 
So there are things called suspensory ligaments. These are these little strings here. These suspensory ligaments reach out from the ciliary body and hold on to the lens. So that's a very important function of the ciliary body. The ciliary body also secretes aqueous humor, which we'll talk about in a second. It's that fluid of the eye. So it secretes the aqueous humor, which is really uh, very important for vision as well as the physiology of the eyeball. So that's the ciliary body, suspensory ligaments, um, and I could talk about the iris. The iris is still part of the vascular layer, and that's the color portion of the eye. And it's basically a diaphragm. It's an adjustable diaphragm that can open and close to control the diameter of the pupil. So it controls the amount of light that can enter the eye by changing the size of the pupil, whether it's dilated or constricted. So that's the iris. And the pupil itself is not, it's an opening. So the pupil is not um, a physical structure. It's the pupil is the opening in the center of the iris that allows light to pass through. Um, when you shine bright light on the eye, the pupil will be constricted because the, the iris is going to try to control the amount of light that gets in. You don't want to bombard your retina with all the stimulation. So your iris is going to constrict the pupil in bright light, but in dim light, you need to be able to see. <clears throat> so your iris will control the amount of light, um, will allow more light in by controlling the size of the pupil. So that was the middle layer, the vascular layer. Finally, we have the inner layer, also called the tunica interna or the retina. So we'll talk about that um, in a bit, but that's the star of the show, right? The retina and the optic nerve make up the neural layer, and that's the part, that's the movie screen that's going to be communicated to the brain. The lens is an interesting um, portion of the eye. So the lens can change shape, but it's very firm. Um, when it gets preserved, so in a dissection, the lens actually gets more like a marble. So it gets very firm, but it's a little bouncy and it's transparent. So they're made up of multiple fibers that are flattened together. There are all these transparent cells that are flattened together and they form this um, disc of sorts. This is the lens. This is an electron micrograph of, uh, of the lens. And like I mentioned before, they're connected to the ciliary muscle by, I'm sorry, by suspensory ligaments. So this is a better image. This is a better way to see the ciliary muscle. So the ciliary muscle goes all the way around the lens and what connects them are these, the suspensory ligaments. And this is important because the lens has to be able to change its shape depending on what we're looking at. This is called accommodation. The idea of the lens changing its shape is called accommodation. So we need to be able to accommodate. Um, we have to be able to use accommodation depending on what we're looking at. So light can be reflect, refracted perfectly on the retina. So what vision is doing, right? Light is being bent. So it gets focused precisely on the retina, specifically in the in a specific area called where that's rich with the photoreceptors that we'll talk about in a bit. So in the case of distance vision, actually I'll, I'll get out of myself a little bit. So um, we need to bend the, we need to bend the light. That's the purpose of, of getting, we need to see something. We need to bend that light that gets refracted from the image. We have to bend it back to our retina so it can then be communicated with our brain. So what's going to be able to refract that light, right? How are we going to be able to take what's out here and make sure that it hits right over here? It's almost like using a series of mirrors in a way to kind of refract a beam of light in just the right position. 
So the cornea does a lot of refraction. And you can read a little bit more about what the refractive index is. So light travels through air at a certain refractive index very easily. But any other material bends light. Like water bends light. Water, the light does not travel directly through water. So the cornea is pretty aqueous. And a cornea does a lot of the refraction. So the light gets bent um, and focused on the retina. And eye optics cause the image to be inverted on the retina, just like a mirror. So even though the A is upright, it gets focused as an inverted A on the optic nerve. And what happens is the cerebral cortex corrects this inversion. So it's an illusion, really. So we're seeing them in their correct orientation. And this is um, illustrated in a microscope, too. Like when you look through a microscope, um, you're really looking at an inverted image that's being corrected by a mirror in the lens. So accommodation of the lens helps to focus light on the retina. So we can adjust the shape of the lens depending if what we're looking at is far away, very close, or kind of a perfect distance. So for distant vision, we call that emetropia. Emetropia is distant vision. Um, and emetropia is a state where the eyes are completely relaxed and they're focused on an object that's more than 20 feet away. So at that point, the light rays coming from the object are basically parallel and they're focusing on the retina very effortlessly. But if we go and shift our eyes to something closer, then we need to be able to focus on something um, specifically. We need to be able to shift, we need to be able to accommodate the lens. So what we're looking at hits the retina appropriately. It has to still hit the retina. So we have to bend that light so it hits the retina in the right location. Um, so in distant vision, emetropia, the ciliary muscles are relaxed and the lens is pretty flat. So this is up here. So distance vision, emetropia, the lens is pretty flat. We don't need to do a lot of bending. And when that happens, the ciliary muscles over here are relaxed. So they hold on very tightly to these suspensory ligaments. So when the lens is flat, try to pick so it's taking up more space. So these are very tight strings when the lens is flat. They're pulling on the lens. Um, the ciliary muscles are relaxed. What happens is the ciliary muscles push. They don't pull. So in near vision, the ciliary muscles contract and they push. They move the ciliary body toward the lens to thicken the lens. We're thickening the lens so it could then bend more light to see something that's closer to us. And when that happens, then the tension on the suspensory ligaments is low. They become more slack. And again, try to visualize this. The ciliary body, um, the ciliary body is relaxed over here. And that means that they're held on very tight to the, to the lens, to the suspensory ligaments. There's a lot of tension. And when they push down, when these guys push down, then there's not going to be as much tension on the suspensory ligaments. They're going to be floppy. And that will push the lens in the middle to thicken it. And that could make it um, able to bend more light. So what you're looking at very close to you can be refracted appropriately on the retina. I know it's a little confusing. I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. This is a great image. Um, I should have just shown this one. So here you see um, in emetropia, the lens is flat. And you can see that the suspensory ligaments are very tense because the ciliary muscles relax. But when we need to accommodate for near vision, we need to thicken the lens. So we need to refract, refract more light on the retina. So what happens is we need to contract the ciliary muscles to push down on the lens to thicken the lens. And in response, the suspensory ligaments will be more relaxed.
right? They're not pulled as in here. As the lens thickens, those become more relaxed. And that's because of the ciliary muscles um, are contracting. So there are chambers and compartments of the eye. We'll talk about compartments first. So the eye has an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment. We'll talk about the posterior compartment first. It contains vitreous humor, which is that jelly-like substance that's between the lens and the retina. And the purpose of this vitreous humor is to press the retina against the eye wall. Just like developing film, you want to have a flat layer of film. You want to press down on the film perfectly. You can't have any air bubbles. So this jelly-like material inside the vitreous humor keeps a nice seal. It keeps this retina flat against the eye wall. Right? Specifically, it's flat against the choroid um, that's in the middle. Right? That was the vascular layer we spoke about. So that's the posterior chamber, filled with vitreous humor, keeps the eye shape, gives it structure, keeps it round. The anterior compartment is broken up into two chambers. So this is where it gets a little tricky. So there's an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment, but the anterior compartment has two different chambers to it. There's the anterior chamber, and that's simply the space between the cornea of the fibrous layer and the iris of the vascular layer. That's the anterior chamber. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. The posterior chamber is the space between the iris and the lens. So in this cross section, you can see this is the posterior chamber. Um, here, you can see this is the, between the iris and the lens. This is the posterior chamber. Between the iris and the cornea is the anterior chamber. Both chambers of the anterior compartment are filled with aqueous humor. So you can remember A for aqueous and anterior. And aqueous humor is a little different um, than the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor helps regulate the internal pressure within the eye and also helps keep the cornea its proper shape. We wanna make sure that the cornea is its proper shape so it can refract light on the retina. Um, the aqueous humor also provides nourishment to the cornea and the lens, just like tears do. So tears are first filtered out of capillaries. So that comes from blood. So the ciliary body capillaries filter out um, the blood to make tears that are first secreted into the posterior chamber, which is between the lens and the iris. And then from the posterior chamber, it goes into the anterior chamber. At the scleral sinus, it is reabsorbed into the blood vessels, and that's where the humor returns to the blood. So this is, again, a liquid that's for the eye, it's just for the anterior compartment of the eye, and this aqueous humor gets filtered from the ciliary body and it flows from the posterior um, chamber to the anterior chamber into the scleral sinus where it goes back into the blood. So at this point, we spoke about the sclera, we spoke about the choroid, that's in red, we spoke about the retina a little bit, we'll talk more about that, we spoke about the vitreous humor, Talk about the ciliary body, the suspensory ligaments, the lens, uh, the iris, the cornea, the pupil, the anterior chamber, posterior chamber. So at this point, um, you might want to review everything again if you don't understand everything on this slide. Now we'll go to the third and deepest layer called the neural layer. And the neural layer is what includes the retina and the optic nerve. So the conversion of light energy into action potentials occurs in the retina. And it's technically part of the brain. It is attached to the eye at the optic disc. So the optic disc over here is the exit of the optic nerve. 
So the optic disc is where the retina is attached to the optic nerve, which is right over here. And the retina, like I mentioned before, is pressed against the rear of the eyeball by the vitreous humor. We want to flat seal the retina against the eye, um, the eyeball. If you get a detached retina from like an injury, that could cause blurry areas of vision and it could cause blindness. And again, think about an example of like when you're trying to um, like press, if you're developing film, you have to press the film down on something and it has to be a perfect seal or else you're going to get an air bubble. Or even think of like a screen protector. If you have, if you, tr you have to put it flat against the screen. Otherwise, you might have little blurry areas. You might have patches on your phone. You won't be able to see through it clearly. And if you really have a detached retina, then you might be blind. And there's corrective surgeries for that um, if you do get a detached retina. So how does an image form on the retina? We said that light has to pass through the lens to form a tiny inverted image on the retina. And we said that the amount of light that passes through the lens is determined by the pupil diameter. And the pupil diameter is controlled by the iris. There are two sets of contractile muscles that control the iris. There is the pupillary constrictor, the pupillary constrictor. And this is smooth muscle that encloses the pupil. And parasympathetic stimulation will close the pupil. It will narrow it like this, like almost like a wheel. So the pupil constricts as the circular pupillary constrictor muscles um, narrow. It will narrow the pupil. And that's in response to parasympathetic stimulation. We don't need to see as much. We don't need to maximize as much um, light getting through. We have other muscles um, outside that are called the pupillary, pupillary dilator muscles. And those look like spokes of a wheel as opposed to the tire of a wheel. So it's like an inverted tire almost. You have the constrictors around the pupil directly, and then the dilators are outside of the constrictors. And in response to sympathetic stimulation, these dilators will contract. And what that does, it pulls on the iris, it pulls it outward to increase the diameter. So we're gonna get as much light as possible. So in bright light, our pupillary constrictors will contract. In dim light, our pupillary dilators will contract. So when light, interchange, um, when light intensity changes, we're gonna have different, um, different contractions of these pupillary muscles. When our gaze shifts between distant and far, we also need to accommodate different amounts of light so they focus, so the image can focus on the retina. And that's what's shown over here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much um, about this, but we oftentimes have some kind of defect in vision. Um, so some kind of defect in image formation could be corrected, right? You could go now very easily and you can get contacts or glasses. So emetropia, normally we have an image that is perfectly refracted onto the retina. So what this is showing is as light enters through the cornea, the lens refracts it. The lens bound, like bends the light. So it hits the retina exactly where it needs to be. However, if you are farsighted, that means the eyeball is too short. So what happens is that the eyeball is too short, the light gets bent behind the retina. So that's, again, hyper, hyperopia is farsightedness. So that's when the eyeball is too short, right? The retina is in front of where the light is hitting or the focal plane. So the focal plane is, is how we define where the light is going to hit. 
So the focal plane is behind the retina if you're farsighted because your eyeball is too short. If the eyeball were longer, then the light would hit the focal plane. The focal plane would be at the retina. So a correction for hyperopia is to use a convex lens. And the convex lens will cause the light rays to converge slightly before, right? So again, we're seeing some convergence before it gets to the lens. So therefore, even though the eyeball is a little short, that convex lens bends the light just a little before it gets to the lens so it can hit uh, the focal plane. If your eyeball is too long, you can imagine that the light rays will then come into focus before they reach the retina. And we would need to correct that with a concave lens. So a concave lens would cause the light rays to diverge slightly. So they're kind of get spread out more. So look how they're narrow over here. The concave lens causes them to diverge a little bit. So when they get to the lens, they'll be refracted properly onto the retina. So even though the eyeball is too long, a concave lens can help refract the light just where it needs to be. And that's all you need to know about lens formation, uh, lenses and image formation. <clears throat> so this is a good time to stop because this is where it gets a little tricky um, in terms of the cellular level of cells interacting with each other. So you might want to pause here um, and make sure you understand everything anatomically um, we spoke about so far. Okay, so the retina is what converts light energy into action potentials. And uh, a little fun fact is the retina is the only part of the brain that you can see without dissection. So using an ophthalmoscope, you can actually see the retina, um, which is part of the brain. And the retina has two types of photoreceptors. And again, photoreceptors, remember means light receptors. We have rods and cones. So these are two special cells of the retina. You can see them over here, rods and cones. Um, these are called photoreceptors because they're activated by light. Rods are used for black and white vision. These are very sensitive, um, but only to the presence of light. It's like, is there something there or not? So this is really important. So rods are very important, um, like in darkness, when we need to um, just see if there's like an object attacking us or, you know, or if we... Um, need to find something like rods are for black and white vision. Like when we just wake up, our rods are sensitive. Um, so it's they're sensitive is the key word. Cones are for color. So the cones require bright light to function. So that's why usually when we like wake up in the middle of the night, it takes some time to get full color vibrancy in our vision um, because we first just see we only have our rods function. So we kind of see in black and white. The cods are a cons. The, that's if you combine a, co a cone and a rod, you get a cod. But a cone is essential for the resolution of images. So the fine details are uh, due to the cones. And we have three different kinds of cones, um, at least. You know, they kind of branch off into different types from there. But each could detect a different color. Maybe we could have like red or green or blue sensitive cones. And cones and rods together allow us to have a perception that is sensitive and highly resolved. So we can get nice resolution and contrast and sensitivity due to our photoreceptors of the retina. There is an area of the retina that's called the macula lutea or the macula lutea, which is um, directly posterior to the lens. So it's directly behind the lens. And it has an area called the fovea centralis. And that is where the cones are most concentrated. So you can remember centralis, the fovea centralis is where the cones are most concentrated. And as you go from the fovea, the cone density decreases. So as you go, and this is, we're looking at like a cross section. We're looking at like a lateral view of the eye over here. So this is the optic disc. Um, the cone density is going to decrease with the distance from the fovea. And the rods 
are least concentrated at the fovea and increase density as they go outward. So again, we have the opposite relationship. Cones are most concentrated at the fovea, rods are least concentrated at the fovea, and the density of rods increases as you go from the fovea, whereas the cone density decreases as you go from the fovea. And behind the retina, we have that pigmented epithelium, um, and that contains melanin. And again, that's going to be responsible for um, preventing backscattering of light. So we had, again, we had melanin in chromatophores of the vascular layer, uh, but we also have melanin um, in the pigmented epithelium. And again, that's like in a camera. It's, you want to make sure that it's black on the inside so the film can develop. But you want to make sure that you make sure if you're going into like a dark room, it has to be dark. You don't want any outside light interfering with you developing your images. You could examine the rear of the eye, the fundus, um, with an ophthalmoscope. So that's how you look at the retina. And you can see the macula pretty well. Um, over here, that's the spot. This is the macula. And you can see that the fovea, which is um, the pit in the center. And the optic disc is also very easily seen with an ophthalmoscope. And that's where the optic nerve exits the retina. So the optic disc is the location where the, op the optic nerve is right behind. So there we have blood vessels also exiting the retina. And this will give us what's called a blind spot, as I'll show you in a bit. So here we have the neural layer. So we have the, the retina. Optic disc is where it's connected to the optic nerve. This is where um, the blind spot would be. So the retina also contains other neurons. Um, so the nerve impulses from the rods and cones over here, our photoreceptors, are then transmitted to bipolar cells. Bipolar cells. And from there, the nerve impulse is transmitted to retinal ganglion cells. It is the axons of these RGCs, or the retinal ganglial cells, that all converge at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. So it's very important to take a second to try to visualize this because this looks like a complicated image. Let's try to understand. This is a, like a, we're looking above the eye. This is the back of the eye. Up all the way down here would be the, the lens. So light is being refracted from the lens into the back of the eye. And it first is going to hit the back of the eye and the pigmented epithelium. So the first cells to receive the message are the photoreceptors, the rods and cones. They then transmit the signals to the bipolar cells, which then go to the ganglion cells. Those all converge at the optic nerve and exit right to the brain. Since there's that part that exits the eye to the brain, that's going to give us an area with no photoreceptors. Right. You can't have any photoreceptors where the um, where the where all the axons are leaving. So that's going to create the blind spot effect. I think I have an, a slide coming up that will show you the blind spot. Um, we have other cells called horizontal cells. Those form horizontal connections between the, bipol between the um, photoreceptors and the bipolar cells. So horizontal cells make horizontal connections and they kind of enhance the perception of contrast and of edge detection. So horizontal cells enhance our visual perception. They help integrate um, signals. Um, and again, amacrine cells have a similar effect. They also, um, the amacrine cells specifically, help um, integrate the message to create better visual perception. So the horizontal cells make 
I'm trying to think of a word. They kind of translate the message. They integrate and translate the message between the rods and cones in the bipolar cells. And these amacrine cells kind of do the same thing between the bipolar cells and the RGCs, the ganglion cells. So we have all together of the retina, rods and cones are the, are the photoreceptors. We then have horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and ganglion cells. These are all the cells of the retina. Altogether, all these cells enhance perception of contrast, edge of objects, um, moving objects, and changes in light intensity. So here's a nice picture. This is the front of the eye. This is the vitreous body. This is the retina. This whole from here to here is the retina. And in the retina we have, here's our ganglion cells. Here's some bipolar cells. Um, you can't see the horizontal, they're not staying, the horizontal cells. Um, the rods and cone nuclei are over here. These are the outer segments of the rods and cones. And this is that melanin-rich pigmented epithelium. So that marks the end of the neural layer. Then this is the vascular layer, choroid. You can see the blood vessels. And then you have sclera, which is, you can see some uh, this is all collagen, dense connective um, tissue that is very tough and fibrous. So the optic disc, like I mentioned, so that's this area right over here. Um, you can't have any photoreceptors here. So the optic disc is where all the blood vessels enter and exit. So we need to have capillaries that are continuous so we can nourish the eye all throughout the eyeball. So blood vessels enter and exit at the optic disc, and those vessels are continuous with capillaries all throughout the eye and the vascular layer, so they can nourish all of the eye. And again, since there are no receptors here, we call that the blind spot. And you could use the, the book talks about this um, illustration of the blind spot. Um, let me see what page it's on. I think it's on page 608. The, if you close your right eye, and stare at the red dot. Keep on moving toward the screen and move your head toward and back from the screen until you see the X disappear. That is your blind spot. What happens is, so again, it should be able to, to, to see the X, to see the red dot disappear. Um, and again, because the image of the dot is falling on the blind spot of your left eye, you're not seeing anything there. But then the question is, why do you still see a green line? Right? It's not like you see just white. You still see a green line. And that's because our brain does visual filling. So the brain has this, does this illusion where it fills in any kind of, any, it fills in the blind spot with whatever's around it. So we don't walk around looking and having like a spot in our visual field all the time, right? We always have a full image. We can see fully clear. And that's because our brain is kind of playing a trick on us and is filling in the blind spot with whatever's around it. So even though we are really not seeing 100% of what's in front of us, our brain is making us um, imagine that we are. So the brain ignores unavailable information until cicades, we have these fast eye movements, very fast um, flickering eye movements, um, ensure that the same area of the visual field doesn't always project onto the same area of the retina. So this is, we can always use these very fine, um, very fine fast muscular movements um, so we can redirect our gaze and see the entire image and not just get focused on um, in one visual field. We need to kind of like glance back and forth to kind of get the whole, the whole um, glimpse of what we're looking at. I hope that makes sense. So take a second to watch this video here.
Great. So that's a good overview of what we spoke about and what we're about to delve a little bit deeper, deeper into. So let's talk about the physiology of vision. And for this, we have to zoom into the photoreceptors. So the rods and cones contain photopigments that can be broken down by light. So that's the first step. We have photoreceptors that have special pigments that can be broken down by light. And when these pigments are broken down by light, the photoreceptors form nerve impulses. So let's just understand that. We have the eye as a sense organ that responds to light stimuli. And we know the photoreceptors are what are in the eye. They have special pigments. Anytime a particle, a photon of light hits it, those pigments in the photoreceptor get broken down. And in response, a nerve impulse is sent along to the optic nerve, to the brain. That's the most overview, but that's the most simple overview I can possibly give. So let's talk about this more. The rods have a pigment called, called rhodopsin. And when a rod is activated by light, rhodopsin is broken into an opsin protein and a molecule called retinal, which looks a lot like vitamin A. That's why vitamin A is important for your vision, they say. So light causes this photochemical reaction, it causes a chemical reaction. It causes rhodopsin to be broken into opsin and retinal. And when opsin is activated, opsin can activate enzymes to form a nerve impulse. So once you have light activating a rhodopsin, the opsin splits from the retinal and the opsin part can activate enzymes so the nerve impulse can be formed. And to say, okay, this photoreceptor right here was just activated by light. This was just stimulated by light. Cones have a different pigment called photopsin. And photopsin, um, the photopsins are different depending on the type of cone. So one type of cone possesses a red sensitive pigment. One has a blue sensitive photopsin. One has a green sensitive photopsin. How we perceive color is a result of the combination of the different kinds of cones and how the different nerve impulses are inter um, interpreted and integrated by the cerebrum. So here's an image of, here's a rod, this is a photoreceptor. Within the outer portion, we have these little discs. And within each disc, we have tons of rhodopsin molecules embedded in these discs. So let's zoom in, this is a rhodopsin because you have an opsin protein and this retinal molecule. So this is what we call a photopigment that's in the photoreceptor. So these discs in the photoreceptor are saturated with these photopigments called rhodopsin. And in response to light, retinal can change its shape. So it goes from this kind of branch shape over here to this shape, the transretinal shape. So in response to light, there is a chemical reaction and the opsin is now going to um, activate some enzymes. So let's talk about how this whole thing um, leads to vision. Let's talk about what happens in the absence of light. That's the best way to think about it. In the dark, here is our rod cell. Here is our bipolar cell and here is our ganglion cell. In the dark, our ganglion cells are not firing to the optic nerve. So we're not going to send, um, the brain is not going to be receiving any message when our eyes are closed. The reason why that is, I'm going to try to go backwards and maybe this, um, I'm trying to see if I should, let me take a step back. When glutamate is present, bipolar cells are inhibited and the retinal ganglial cells are not activated. Glutamate is released in the dark. So when it's dark out, 
or when you're closing your eyes, these rods steadily release glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter, at the base of their cells. This is the basal end. So when there's no stimulation from light, that means glutamate is released by this rod cell, which means this bipolar cell will be inhibited, which means they're not going to communicate with these retinal ganglion cells, and no action potential will be produced. So take a second to really understand that. So close your eyes right now, and as you're closing your eyes, know that glutamate is being released from your rods to inhibit bipolar cells to not communicate with your ganglion cells. So your brain is not seeing anything. However, when the pigments of rods or cones do absorb light, then the glutamate secretion stops. So the opsin activation, we'll see, stops the glutamate from being secreted. And if no glutamate is secreted, that means the bipolar cells are no longer inhibited. So the bipolar cells can now release a neurotransmitter to the retinal ganglion cells to produce an action potential. This happens because of the opsin enzyme was activated by light. So when light is absorbed by the rhodopsin, we said that retinal sh changes, changes its shape, right? That's what really happens first. So light hits rhodopsin, the retinal changes its shape, which activates the opsin enzyme. That opsin enzyme inhibits glutamate release from the rod. How it does that? is opsin can break down the second messenger cyclic AMP, which is what normally triggers the glutamate from being released. So in its natural state in the dark, there's a lot of cyclic GAMP, that's a cousin of cyclic AMP, that is in the rod cell that's making the glutamate being released. So when there's a lot of cyclic GMP, glutamate is being released, which means no message is being sent. However, in response to light, the retinal in, ro in the rhodopsin changes its shape. That will activate the opsin enzyme, which will then degrade all of the intracellular cyclic GMP. So no more glutamate will be released. If no more glutamate is released, the bipolar cell will then communicate with the retinal ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are the only retinal cells that actually produce action potentials. They're the last to get the message, really, um, of the retina. Even though they're the closest to the light source, in a way. Um, this is not a good image. of. Uh, so if you're looking at this tree, the, even though the retinal ganglion cells is closest to the source you're looking at, it's the last to receive the message in the retina. And these ganglion cells are responding to the bipolar cells as their neurotransmitters increase and decrease. So the ganglion cells respond to the bipolar cells um, based on their neurotransmitters, and they'll send either very frequent action potentials if you're seeing something very bright, or very few action potentials if you're seeing something that's dimmer. So via the optic nerve, right, that's all being sent through these ganglion cells, these changes will provide signals to the brain of what's going on outside. The photoreceptors that are in the retina have to then transmit all of their impulses along cranial nerve to the optic nerve to the brain. And we know the visual cortex is all the way in the back, right? It's all the way posterior and caudal. So we need to go quite a ways from the retina to the visual cortex. So, and of course, we know we have to make a pit stop along the way in the thalamus, right? We have to stop in the thalamus and the thalamus will then relay the message um, to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So the photoreceptor nerve impulses are transmitted along cranial nerve two, the optic nerve to the brain. And something interesting happens at the optic chiasm. 
the two optic nerves meet at this chiasm, this crossing. And axons from the medial half of each retina cross over to the opposite side. So let me show you um, what that means. So here, the medial half of the left retina, right, which is looking at the left visual field, crosses over to the right side of the brain. Whereas the medial half of the right retina crosses over to the left side of the brain. So that happens at the optic chiasm. And you can see that um, in a brain dissection, which unfortunately we won't be able to do. But um, by watching the videos, you can definitely see the optic chiasm um, on the underside of the brain. Optic tracts carry the axons from the chiasm to the LGN, which is called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And that's a part of the thalamus. So it goes to the thalamus first, and then the thalamus will relay that information to the occipital lobe, where the primary visual cortex will interpret what the light pattern detected was. So again, it's very, very hard. You have to kind of keep on reviewing vision to really understand how the whole thing works, what the big picture is, pun intended. Right? Think about the world, like your retina is like a camera and you're looking at the world through pixels. So every pixel can activate a certain photoreceptor in the back of your camera. I hope that makes sense. It's, I, using my hands right now um, to try to explain it. Uh, but you're, again, your your eyes are like a camera. It's like a moving video camera. Uh, and each photoreceptor in the back of your retina is activated by one particle of light. And those particles of light can then send an action potential that will then get sent to a certain place in the thalamus that corresponds to a place in space. This is getting very confusing, but there's like a map in the LGN that corresponds to the visual field. So these neurons get routed to a certain level of the thalamus, um, and then they, that they get transmitted to the primary visual cortex, which can interpret that as an image. The crossing of the medial axons is what allows us to see a 3D. And that's one of the things that makes primates unique, is stereoscopic vision, to allow us to perceive depth. So let's just review um, the mechanisms of vision. First, light is bent as they pass through the cornea. Um, depending on how far away the image is and the light conditions of the, of the environment, the iris will control the amount of light passing through the pupil. Right, we spoke about those, um, those muscles that constrict in response to parasympathetic or sympathetic simulation. The ciliary body also helps adjust the lens. Um, so the shape can accommodate and focus the light rays on the retina. As the light hits the retina in the right place, the light is absorbed by the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, which activate bipolar cells by inhibiting the release of glutamate. By inhibiting the release of glutamate, the retinal ganglion cells are then activated and are transmitted to the cranial nerve two. So the nerve impulses go from the bipolar cells, the retinal ganglion cells, whose axons converge at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. We said that the medial fibers of the optic nerves cross, they decussate, they cross over at the chiasm, and they merge with the lateral axons on that side to form optic tracts. And the optic tracts are what carry the message from the chiasm to the thalamus, specifically the LGN of the thalamus. 
From there, um, third order, order neurons will then transmit the message from the thalamus to the occipital lobe. And then the, that's where the occipital lobe, which is part of the cerebral cortex, will like, interpret what we just saw from both um, sides of the visual field. This is actually um, a very short image, a very short video on color um, that I'd like you to watch. Very interesting how we perceive color um, in the world around us. Um, color blindness is a hereditary alteration or a lack of one photopsin. So it could be a um, hereditary condition that's most common is red green color blindness. That's um, maternally, it's X-linked. So that means that it's more common in men than women because uh, it's a recessive disorder. And red-green color blindness results from either L or M cones, which are two kinds of cones that help distinguish between red and green. So this causes a difficulty between relating the two shades from each other. So if you cannot see the number inside here, that means you have red-green color blindness because you can't distinguish between the red and the green pigments because you don't have the right cones to distinguish between the different stimuli. So the number should say 74. So is it 8% in males? This is actually quite common. So this has um, been a few years since this controversy, but what do you see here? What color is the dress to you? So to me, it is very clearly white and gold. Uh, I know some of you are saying, what? No way, how could it be white and gold? Um, some of you might see it as black and blue. Maybe that changed it. Maybe not the black background. It has a lot to do with what our brain is subtracting. So it's an illusion. Uh, these colors, this is, a, this is the best image I can get to try to explain it. This image looks white. This apron looks white and this image looks, this apron looks blue but they're really the same color. It just has to do with the background, what's behind it. So it, our brain sometimes will subtract different colors um, to try to interpret what one color is. So some of our brains um, will deduce this as being yellow and white or like gold and white, whereas some will look at it as being blue and black. So this is like an optical illusion that's still being studied, but it has to do with how our brain tries to subtract color to try to focus on one color. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not going to talk about too many disorders. I think I've spoken enough about the eye. Um, it's good to get some familiarity with cataracts and glaucoma. Glaucoma is when there's too much pressure um, in the eye, intraocular pressure. And that's because aqueous humor is improperly drained. And if you don't drain your humor, you build up too much pressure and that can cause the retinal cells to be compressed and the blood vessels are compressed. So they have no oxygen. And once you have glaucoma, you cannot restore vision. Um, and cataracts are clouding of the lens and that happens with age a lot of times, but it's also environmental. So, um, diabetes, smoking, drugs can all influence um, cataracts. But you can get cataract surgery by replacing the natural lens with a plastic lens. Plastic lens. So stereoscopic vision, stereoscopic vision is depth perception, right? It's the ability that we can judge how far away something is. And this is something that's unique to primates as far as um, we know. And the fixation point, right, is the point in space on which the eyes are focused. And we said the fixation point has to be on the retina. But depending on where, if the object is near or distant, that fixation point um, may be um, slightly medial or lateral. Because we need to use two different eyes with overlapping visual fields in order to perceive depth. So our eyes are tilted. 
this is called convergence, right? We can tilt our eyes so we can overlap them. And when we have this overlap, we overlap the visual fields, we can look at the same object from different angles and then perceive depth. This is different from panoramic vision, like a horse or a mouse. They have eyes on the opposite sides of their head, so they can see what's left and right. Like for predators, that's great. But they can't see what's right in front of them in full 3D. And then if you haven't watched this video, watch this again, and maybe um, you'll gain a different understanding from it. So that brings us to the end of the material that will be covered um, in this course. I'd like you to look over a few disorders of the eye just to be acquainted. And I'd also like you to watch the crash course videos on hearing. Um, and that's an important thing that you should, you should be familiar with, but we're not going to have time to cover in this course. So please watch um, the video contained in the ebook as well as the crash course video on hearing. And I just want to say it was a pleasure teaching you um, online. I wish I could have had the pleasure to meet you in person, but hopefully you found the course rewarding and you learned a lot about the wonders of the human body. And I hope you continue to learn about more in AMP2. Until then, thank you for joining my course and I wish you all the best.